short history of digital disobedience. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm going to go right into it. This is uh, a picture of a 43-year-old woman named Tracy Ann Valenzuela. Tracy it lives in a small, uh, middle-class suburban neighborhood in Napa Valley, California. She's got two daughters, 10 and 12, both who are into sports. So Tracy is, in every sense, a soccer mom. I uh, asked her how she describes herself, and she said, I'm normal. Tracy, as it turns out, is actually also something else. She is being accused in federal court right now of being a part of the mysterious, shady, underground international hacking collective known as Anonymous. Tracy, allegedly, along with thousands of other people, participated in a digital online protest against the company's MasterCard, Visa, and PayPal when those companies cut off financial services to WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks has said since then that this represented 95% of their income. So this was all gone in one day. The home pages of MasterCard, Visa, and PayPal, the home pages that you go to, visa.com, were, were in some cases, as a result of this digital protest, slowed down or in some brief cases actually shut down in what they called a virtual sit-in. When this attack was finished, uh, all of the web traffic went back up normal. There was no permanent damage. There was no personal data lost from anybody, and there was no real uh, effect on commerce. For this action, Tracy is facing, currently, 15 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. So what causes a 43-year-old soccer mom from Napa Valley to take on some of the biggest financial corporations in the world? The answer to that question hits right at a battle for control over the internet that it's actually been building for some time. I asked Tracy to explain, and she said briefly that she didn't want her daughters to ask her later, why didn't you do something? Right after these protests, I started making a documentary about Anonymous that became the documentary um, We Are Legion, the story of the hacktivists. Now, at the time, nobody had ever heard of them, but it was, it seemed to me, the emergence of a non-state tribe complete with their own language and uniquely defined on issues of vital importance to their internet home. It seemed to me at the time, and I still think this, that they are something new in the human experience. And how often do you find yourself saying that, really, about anything? But the more I got to know them and the more I talked to people who identified as anonymous, the more I realized that they are children of the moment and their existence says something bigger about privacy, abuses of technology, and how anonymity itself fuels the wild creativity of the internet. The story of Anonymous starts pretty much here with the website 4chan. Now this is an image board created by Christopher Moodpool when he was 15 years old, in, uh, reportedly in his mom's basement. It became wildly popular and the story of Anonymous actually starts on a part of it called the B board. This is where random content went that was too offensive too disgusting or too just off point for the rest of the site. The turnover and competition for space on 4chan is high. So to remain relevant, you have to be really disgusting, really offensive, or just really hilarious. And if you succeeded at this, <laughs> other people would steal your work and add to it, which makes it, of course, just even funnier. Uh, basically, what you do on 4chan is you post a picture and you post whatever it is you want to say. And this rolls by so quickly that the competition for space is high. You, you, you need to keep up to be relevant. Um, so it created a meme machine from which sprang some of the funniest things you saw on the internet at that time. Uh, <laughs> a famous example of this is lolcats, right? So this is people stealing uh, an idea and building on it which is something that we've all kind of seen and, and uh, delivered. Rick Rowling is another one. People on B, after a while, began to perform pranks on people for the sake of the lulls, which is kind of like a schadenfreude, like a comeuppance kind of laughter at the expense of others. And they continue making these tacks, mostly in that weird end of internet subculture we never see, each one kind of Getting a, changing them a little bit, making them evolve. The best way to sum up this period might be to quote J.R.R. Tolkien when he says, do not meddle in the affairs of wizards, for they are subtle and quick to anger. Uh, then they got a taste for political fights going up against the Church of Scientology. 
But the MasterCard, Visa, and PayPal attacks cracked open new possibilities for dissent online and truly kicked off the wild ride we've seen in recent years. In January 2011, this man, Muhammad Bouazizi, set himself on fire in Tunisia to protest a repressive regime there. This effectively ignites the Arab Spring. Anonymous decides they want to get, they want to protest too. This moves them to protest. And so they conduct denial of service attacks on Tunisian government websites. And when the Tahir, uh, and when Arab Spring ignites again in Tahir Square in Egypt, uh, then President Hosni Mubarak tries to thwart protesters by shutting off the internet connection there. Now for Anonymous, they see the internet as their home. This is a line you don't cross. You don't mess with our home. You don't mess with our connectivity. Uh, what Mubarak did was, actually this is a graph of what he did, just after January 27th, he just cuts off internet. So you see all the traffic going, and then suddenly there is nothing coming out of Egypt. So, along with another group called Telecomics, Anonymous reaches out to eight Egyptian protesters with a 160-page care package showing how to circumvent online censorship and deal with things like tear gas. They translate these into Arabic and send it off. This continues with incident after incident, hack after attack, hack after hack, attack after attack, for a while. And there's far too many of these to mention here or to go into, but, uh, and they're incredibly diverse. So I'll take some examples from the, I'll give you some examples from the past year. They protested the Westboro Baptist Church when that group decided to protest themselves at the Sandy Hook Elementary after those shootings. They shut down the website of Golden Dawn, which was a Greek neo-Nazi site uh, that was opening a chapter in New York. They took down two Ugandan government sites when that country was considering the death penalty for homosexuality. After these protests, that part of the bill was removed. In November, they actually sent similar care packages to protesters in Syria when Assad followed in Mubarak's footsteps and did what you never do with anonymous <laughs> cut off internet connection. Uh, dictators like to do this. Uh, they also engaged in an uh, operation they called Op Save the Arctic, where they stole email information from oil company websites to protest Arctic drilling. They also often lend what you would call tech support to street protests. That's basically what they did with Occupy. And uh, this protest sparked by police shootings in Anaheim. Or these in Russia, after the beginning of Putin's third term as president. They often see these things and see what they can do technologically or on the internet in order to help or aid these kinds of things. But I want to rewind a bit because even with all the attention that Anonymous gets, they are hardly the first hacktivist group. The word hacker was first used by the Tech Model Railroad Club and it was used as a sign of technical virtuosity. Uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak actually engaged in something that they called phone freaking in which they used a now famous black box to hack the tones in the telephone lines to get free long distance. <laughs> they actually sold these to college students to make a profit. So you could call this the first Apple product. <laughs> and they sold them for like three to four hundred dollars. Does that sound familiar? Um, <laughs> uh, so Wozniak actually reportedly once used it to call the Vatican while posing as Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. <laughs> Hacking, pranking, and humor have always gone hand in hand. The notorious pranks at MIT have long been looked at as a source of pride. Um, but pretty soon, the government really began to fear <laughs> hackers. Um, in 1983, the movie War Games came out. This is, uh, if you've seen this, this is where the scrappy young hacker played by Matthew Broderick actually almost starts a nuclear war in his bedroom. He's trying to impress a girl. Uh, and uh, this movie was so frightening to Congress that they passed the CFAA, or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The CFA started in 1984, the original draft. And this was 10 years before there is widespread internet use. And it is still the primary law that governs it. The primary law that governs internet, uh, internet use now. In the 90s, we see a whole resurgence of what you might call hacktivism, people using the computer in order to make a political point. And the term itself is coined by a, the, a hacker named Omega, who is a member of a group called Cult of the Dead Cow. 
One particularly relevant example is in 2001, a German group is angry that the airline Lufthansa is using their planes to deport migrants out of their country. So they take down the Lufthansa site. This is significant because the German court at this point overturns a prior conviction saying these protests might be considered protected freedom of speech. So up until this point, most of the court kind of de decisions on this decided that this could be legitimate political protest. And these are some of the same kinds of hacks, by the way, that Tracy and others are currently facing so much jail time for. One of the things, the interesting things to me that happens when you look back at a chronology of hacktivism, you realize that periods of radical activity often give way to periods of more what you would call traditional activity or traditional political activity. In other words, from a well of deep anger and transgression can, can spring legitimate political organization. And those organizations can make a difference. Take these, for instance. The Center for Democracy and Technology, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, or the one that most people have heard of, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or the EFF. Now, all of these organizations are dedicated mostly to three things. Enhancing freedom of expression, protecting online privacy, and limiting government surveillance. They draw people with a passionate connection to these issues, but also might shy away from the more kind of radical or subversive elements. These are people who believe that awareness isn't enough, that you actually have to change policy. Building, after all, is much harder than breaking. And there are numerous disturbing consequences to online vigilantism. Now, I have just spent years as she mentioned, talking with hundreds of internet activists of all kinds from all over the world. And one common denominator is really that they're done with the system. They think it's unfixable. They think it's irretrievably broken. Why bother trying to fix it? It's time to throw it out and just start over. I am now making a new film, a new documentary about someone who did not fit into that category. Aaron Swartz, wanted to hack the system in the best sense. As a young internet prodigy and activist, he wanted to work within existing systems, using technology to improve them. It was one of the reasons why he couldn't stand being labeled or would not accept being labeled a felon. Now, I'm not gonna go into Aaron's full story here, but I want you just to take a look at some of the organizations he was involved with or helped to build. The Open Library Project public.resource.org, Change Congress, Fix Congress First, Root Strikers, which you'll hear more about later in an incredible talk from Lawrence Lessig. Lawrence, by the way, who's speaking later, once described Aaron as his mentor rather than vice versa. Add to Aaron's accomplishments the Sunlight Foundation, the PCCC, the organization Demand Progress that led an overwhelmingly successful campaign last year to overturn the draconian internet law, SOPA. Then, Add the stuff maybe you've heard of, RSS, Creative Commons, and Reddit, the most per currently the most popular social news site on the internet. So take a look at this list for just a moment. And remember, he was 26 years old. He was charged with breaking into a computer network at MIT. The main victim of the crime, JSTOR, dropped all charges against him. But somehow, a two-year legal nightmare for Aaron dragged on. Questions about this prosecution are still being asked, including by Republican Senator John Cornyn, who wrote a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder saying this might have been prosecutorial zeal or even, his words, quote unquote, misconduct. Carmen Ortiz, the US attorney overseeing Aaron's case, said this about it. Stealing is stealing, whether it's with a computer or a crowbar. But considering what Aaron was facing and the amount of time that he was facing, prison time that he was up against, from the point of view of many internet activists, this badly misunderstands both computers and crowbars. <laughs> One wonders what uh, Carmen Ortiz would have done had she uh, caught Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak breaking into the phone system. Pretty sure they went on to do something of significance. Uh, there is a gulf between our laws and new technologies that started early, but it has, somehow it has just gotten worse. In 2008, Senator Ted Stevens from Alaska famously said this, the internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's a series of tubes. <laughs> a lot of people are still trying to figure this out, by the way. <laughs> 
At Aaron's, at a speech for Aaron in, in New York City, a man named Edward Tuft got up to speak. Now, Tuft has been a professor at Yale and Princeton and has done incredible work with visualizing data. This is taking data that is boring and monotonous and tedious to look at, and it's making it into something that's visual, that's that, that we can understand at first glance. He's often been called the Leonardo da Vinci of data. When Edward was Aaron's age, he was also investigated for manipulating the phone system. AT&T and the investigators at that point decided he was just an adventurous kid, and they decided to let him off. Every day, he said, every day I am thankful they didn't choose to ruin my life. But more and more, law enforcement isn't making that choice. Cybercrime has become our latest fear. In the last few years, we've seen a harsh crackdown on activists, hacktivists, whistleblowers, and quote unquote hackers of all kinds. But hacktivists don't often break the law. A Verizon report that came out last week called their effect quote unquote negligible but they're loud and they're aggressive and they're dramatic and theatrical. That makes them low-hanging fruit for those who just want to look tough on crime. In the meantime, real cybercrime has become almost institutionalized, the way Frank Hyde has been pointing out in his excellent talks. Aaron got caught in this cycle. Do you remember the CFAA, that law created after the movie War Games? 11 of the 13 charges against Aaron were based on that law. He made a principal decision to say that he was not in the wrong and to reject the plea deals he was facing and to fight the charges. But he was so exhausted financially and emotionally that after a two-year battle, he sadly gave up the fight by taking his own life. Aaron believed that you should ask yourself, what is the most important thing I can be doing in the world right now? And if you aren't doing that, why aren't you? I think we can expand that question a little bit. If we aren't protecting people like Aaron or Tracy, then why aren't we? If we aren't protecting innovators who are more interested in the public good than in making a quick buck on the next internet startup, if we aren't going to protect dissent or protect a whistleblower that is coming forward at their own risk with information that is in the public good, information that will make our lives better, then why aren't we? Innovation and democracy are born from transgression. Human law should be at the service of morality, justice, and forward progress, not hindering it. Hackers are people who understand the technology, are often personally angered by those abusing it, and who are endlessly looking for ways to innovate. We need them. We need people who are, to quote Wallace Stevens, searching the possible for its possibleness. So in the meantime, let's not throw them all in jail. Now, I'm not gonna try to convince you that anonymous is all good and that you should embrace them unconditionally. I certainly don't. They do some things that are completely ridiculous and completely stupid. And it's not my place to convince you that after this talk, maybe tonight, you should stop on the way home and buy a Guy Fox mask so you can wear it while you're furiously typing in your basement today, <laughs> taking down oppressive regimes. You know, though, if you want some tips later, catch me. I, I may know some people that know some people. <laughs> But I will say this, our world is changing and we're facing a choice. Are our technological tools going to be tools of wild creativity, expression, and revolution? Or are they gonna to be tools of surveillance and control? Arthur C. Clarke once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So will, will our technology continue to extend our reach in magical ways, or will it begin to be used on us? Love them or hate them, there is a small group of merry pirates who have their answer to that question already, and they're shouting it from the rooftops, saying, let's keep the revolutionary fires burning. Thank you. <laughs>